So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little exercise. So let me, let me kind of motivate the exercise where we're gonna try to use the tools that I just described to like figure out a secrets message that I've embedded in the genome. So the steps we're gonna do are uh, de novo assembly with all past LG. It's a small data set, you know, it'll run in five minutes or it'll run in two minutes. Um, give us a nice assembly, and then we're going to use whole genome alignment with Mummer to then be able to go look at it. Now, the scenario that I set up, do, do people remember from a couple years ago, there was this big hoop, hoopla about supposedly there was this microorganism uh, living in, I think it was called Mirror Lake. It was in this uh, Yellowstone National Park. Or supposedly this microorganism that, that used arsenic instead of phosphorus. Is like, people are like really excited about this. Uh, uh, it turned out that it was like totally false, right? It turned out that in the in the gel that they're looking at, there was trace amounts of phosphorus that the genome was picking up. So it turned out to be totally false. It was just kind of like a, it was kind of a fun project where I went to this remote environment, collected the sequences, did an assembly. You know, what do we see here? So that'll be kind of part one of the secret messages. Let's imagine we've gone to this remote environment. We've sequenced, you know, a, a microbe that looks very much like a. Uh, 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 this one that they, they thought used phosphorus instead of, uh, they use arsenic instead of phosphorus, but in there I've embedded a secret message that we have to decode. The way I've encoded the secret message is, uh, this is another project in, published in 2010 from George Church, where they dev devised a scheme to encode binary data into DNA. There's lots of ways that you can imagine this, so DNA is like ACGT, all computers work around a binary system where it's just zeros and ones. So you can imagine lots of ways we're going to encode zeros and ones into ACGT and vice versa. Uh, the, the critical thing that they're trying to do is like, you know, avoid long homopolymers because that's bad for, you know, the sequencing technology. So they had some ways where you're going to build in some redundancy. So it wasn't as simple as, you know, A is zero, zero, because that can do uh, bad things. So anyway, in this paper from George Church, they had this idea, well, we're going to take uh, some binary file. In particular, they used, I think it was like a PDF of a book that George had worked on. They actually, so then they encoded, you know, in silico into DNA. But then they actually did kind of this clever, cute thing where then they synthesized the molecules that had those DNA, put it in a test tube, pulled it out, did sequencing of it, reassembled the whole book, you know. So they went full circle from digital to analog molecules back to digital. In the paper, they, they make all these like bold claims about how this is the most uh, amazing archival storage you can ever imagine because you can store the entire Library of Congress in like, you know, a thimble full of water. This is a terrible idea because then you have no random access, right? If you want to just like pull out one book, well, we have to sequence 100 terabases to pull out one book. So it's a terrible idea, but, you know, good for them. They got a cute science paper out of this. Uh, so this is the, so in this paper, they described this uh, encoding algorithm. David Dooling, who used to work at WashU, encoded it for uh, one of these puzzles we like to do. So there's a Perl script that will do this encoding, you know, based exactly on the, on the rules that, that George has uh, put together. Okay, so the process is gonna be, first we have to kind of update your cloud instance. We're gonna download some data that I have just hosted on my website. We're then gonna assemble the reads with all pass LG. Uh, line it to the reference genome. We're going to look for the foreign sequence, look for and then extract the foreign sequence with bed tools. We're going to run our decoder, and then hopefully, if everything goes well, we'll get like a little laugh that where we like you know get the secret message. Okay, so let's go ahead and boot up the cloud instances. I'm going to be kind of going back and forth between slides and um, the virtual machine. I have all, I have the exact commands I'm going to run in the slide deck. So if you're like, you know, trying to keep up with me, you miss something. If you look in the slide deck, it's going to have everything. There's a couple of critical spots where if we have a typo, things will look, come out really weird or crash. So we're just going to be really, we're going to be really careful uh, with all that. Okay. Let's, uh, let's try to boot this up. I think in my, uh, let's see. Build. So does everybody know how to boot up their virtual machine and get things going? Okay. Assembly stuff. So I'm just going to connect to my instructor instance. I believe everybody has either their own instance or their sharing instances, but I'm just going to take as given everybody knows how to get to the prompter. Very good. We got some theme music going on. Awesome. 
So is everybody able to <laughs> is everybody able to connect to their instance? So step one is good. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do, uh, well, so let's do the first thing, which is going to be um, as we're, so you guys talked a lot about virtual machines, about how they're like these you know, computers we can boot up on demand, install custom software, all this stuff. So as instructors, uh, months ago, we collected the requirements of what, what software packages should be installed on all of your virtual machines. But I kind of in a silly way forgot one of the key requirements. So the very first thing we're going to do is install one of the key dependencies. So I've already done it on my machine, um, but you guys are going to have to do it. So I apologize in advance, but it'll be a good process. So it's not so bad. We're just going to run one command. Did you guys talk about how there's this package manager app get? Well, OK. So we're going to do, this is the command we're going to run is app get install GNU plot. We're going to use sudo to run this so that um, we can run it as root. Hopefully, it'll just take like one minute to download and install. When I push enter, it's going to say, Mike, you've already installed this. When you push enter, it'll probably say uh, something like, do you want to proceed? Just say yes. Just like, yep. We want all the defaults. We want to install it. We want to do this. So you can ignore the part where it says GNU plot is already installed in the newest version. You can ignore that should just be able to zip forward and just say yes to get do the install. Are people able to install GNU plot? Getting some head nods. If you are not able to do it, cheat off your neighbor. This is not SATs. We strongly encourage you to cheat off your neighbor. Uh, see what's going on there. Does everybody know about the, the tab command, like the tab key? This should be like your, your most favorite, you know, button is that it can do like magical things. So that, that'll become really useful. Okay, so step one is to make sure GNU plot is installed. Uh, if you having problems with that, cheat off your neighbor, flag me down. Okay, so step two will, or is going to be to download the, the reference data. I went ahead. And, oh, I'm sorry. I went ahead and just put it up in a package, a file on my website. So I'm just going to copy this over. If everything goes well, you know, in in eight tenths of a second. <laughs> You should be able to download this file from my lab website. So the command I did for this is using the command wget. We're going to at this URL. We're going to grab it. I put the slides up on the wiki so you can just like copy and paste uh, it out of there. A common typo in my last name is to ignore the C. So if it's like, oh, Mike, it's not working, double check you don't have a typo. Are people able to get this? OK, good. So did you guys, you guys talk about so-called tarballs? Yeah. So the TGZ is a clue that this is a tarball. It's like a zip file. It's like lots of files get bundled together into one. We're going to run the magic spell to unpack it, which is, I like, to, I like to use this version of it, tar xzvf, and then that will unpack things. Let me uh, scroll up so people can see. So we did this wget command, and then more recently I did this tar command. If everything is like checking out, we're going to see something like this happen. This will this will tell you which files are being unpacked out of this tarball. Getting some head nods. Yes. Okay. So in, so I, so as we can we just get a listing here of the files. So. What I just gave you are a few things. So we have a file here. It's a, it's a fastq file, frag 180. Again, all pass requires a fragment library where the reads overlap. So this come, these are 100 base pair reads that come from 180 base pair fragment. We also have a jumping library of 2KB mates. Again, these are these circularized molecules, extract the mates. I'm also including the reference genome from that science paper where they falsely discovered the species. I mean, it's a real species. It's just doesn't use arsenic the way they thought it did. I'm including the Perl script that will do the encoding and decoding. Um, in addition, I'm including these two special files, in groups CSV and in libs uh, CSV. Those will be critically important for all paths. Those describe the data requirements so that it knows where the files live and what the libraries are. It, you know, it, doesn't rely out, it doesn't require the file names to be named a certain way. It uses those in libs and in groups file uh, to figure this out. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to CD into that ASM directory because you know when, it, um, when I expanded the tarball, I created a new directory. We can see all these things in here. 
If you want to look at the file, you know, I, I like this command less. Uh, we can just look inside of here, this frag file. Uh, so this is, these are simulated reads. So the, the uh, fastq file is going to look kind of weird in the sense that, you know, we have, we have DNA characters. Uh, and then we have these weird quality values, and that's just because I, I just in a very I wrote you know I use a simple simulator that just gives um, a simple quality value string. It doesn't try to be all that realistic. It goes from very high quality bases to low quality bases. Does everybody know like about the stupid origins of FastQ files? Okay, it's like the worst file format you could possibly ever imagine. But so be it. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Okay, so my, my claim to you is someplace in these sequences is the secret message. Uh, there's sequen there's you know, simulated sequencing error. If you look at the bases, they're all just you know, nucleotides. It's not obvious you know, where it would be, so we're going to have to go look for it. It's not like it's the first read or the last read. It's kind of all jumbled in there is what we're going to have to go look at. Okay, uh, so let me switch back to the uh, slide deck. And then I'll talk about some of the other files that are present there. OK, so as we, as we mentioned, the most critical thing for all pass LG, you know, it'll determine if you can use it or if you cannot, are the data requirements. It has this data, as we talked about, it has this data requirement for this 180 base pair uh, library where the, you know, the two reads overlap. If you have, you know, if you're running, I don't know, 150 base pair reads, you can, you can have uh, overlapping reads from a little bit larger fragments, but the critical thing is the reads have to overlap. <clears throat> and then also you have to have one, at least one jumping library. Okay, so we talked about this, we talked about this. Uh, if you're interested, so in this case, we've gone ahead and installed all pass for you. If you ever need to, you know, assemble it, if you ever need to assemble something on your own at your own institution, you can just go to the, uh, just Google for all pass, it'll take you to a page at Broad. Uh, follow their instructions on how to install it. If you want, you know, requirements on how to how to run this, you know, for a microbe you can do it on your laptop. If you're going to sequence, if you're going to sequence and assemble like human, you need a big machine. You're going you're to want like on the order of a terabyte of RAM or half a terabyte of RAM, many processors, you know, many terabytes of space. If you want to buy one of these machines, it's going to be on the order of a few tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, very recently, Amazon made machine instances available with more than a terabyte of RAM, I believe. I think it's 1.5. They're not, they're not cheap, but, you know, it, it'll be, you know, $1,000 to get an assembly, but it'll be, you know, a pretty good assembly. The amount of time it's going to take is, you know, totally depends on the size of the genome. In our example, it's going to take, like, a couple minutes, a few uh, 100 KB. Human genome, they're, they're saying 500 hours, perhaps 5,000 hours. The biggest genome I ever tried to assemble was a, a variety of wheat that was many gigabases. Uh, I ran, so the biggest machine that we have at Cold Spring Harbor has 1.5 terabytes of RAM. I quickly ran that out of RAM. Uh, so I used a supercomputing, uh, a supercomputer at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center called Blacklight that has uh, 32 terabytes of RAM. I ran that out of RAM. Uh, so then we had to do a bunch of filtering to try to downsample the repeats because it had to spill the transposable elements. We let the assembler run for like three months on a thousand cores and then it finally completed. So I believe that is the biggest all pass assembly that has ever been attempted. I would never do it again. It was a, it was a miserable assembly. <laughs> so we're going to redo it with PacBio and you know, pray that it gets better. Okay. So how do you install it? These instructions are available, but I'm just going to jump through it because it was already done. Okay. Critical thing. So, we're going to provide, you know, FASTQ files. You can also give it, you know, FASTA files or BAM files. Again, the two critical uh, files are going to be these in libs and in groups. The file formats there have a very strict uh, 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 requirements. This is a real example describing it. It's very tedious to like type this in, so I just gave it to you. If you're interested, oops, if you're interested to look at it, just go to your terminal. Let's look at some of these things. So the in groups file uh, just describes the path to the files where the data live. So what this says is that there's a library that I'm just calling 180 and a library called 2K. The file names are, you know, this fast Q file. This, this question mark is a code for saying any file name that, that sort of matches this pattern will be acceptable. 
So there's a one file and a two file from the two ends of the reads for those two libraries. So that's the in groups. And then the in libs, sorry for the tedious stuff, but I just wanted to spend two minutes to look at it. This is uh, one big line. So it's a big comma separated uh, file. There are two libraries, so it just describes those two libraries. One is a fragment library, one is a jumping library. Uh, you know, fragment size is 180 base pairs, the insert size is 2 KB. We give it a standard deviation and so forth. My recommendation is if you ever need to run this, just like take this sample file and then just edit it. Typing it in from scratch is very tedious. Okay, so those are the two files. So the first thing that we're going to do is um, uh, prepare the data for all paths. So it's, they've, they have segmented it into kind of a two-phase approach. We're going to go from raw FASTQ files, basically do some conversion pre-processing into the file formats that they want. And then once that's done, then you actually run the assembler to actually build the, the contigs and, and scaffolds. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy this line out of my slides and then paste it in, and then hopefully things will be kosher. Yeah, okay. So let me, uh, so this is the command I just ran. You can copy it out of slides or you can copy it off the screen. Here, I'll move it up so everybody can see. Uh, so it's, the command is prepare all paths. Hopefully this will be in your path. I'm using um, some special Unix. So you could ignore, the, ignore the, the caret C at the end. I just was trying to move this up. Um, so it's prepare all pass inputs. What I'm saying is the data live in the current directory. This is a shorthand for saying live in the current directory. The ploidy of this uh, sample is one. I'm going to send all the outputs to this log file called prepare.log. Uh, and that way, you know, if there's a problem, we can go check out that prepare file. So again, you don't need this caret C at the end. That was just me trying to um, uh, be able to move that up. OK, so let's. People are able to run that, so let's look in this prepare.log file. Yeah, if you're in the ASM directory, you're good to go. And then from that directory, you can just run this prepare all pass inputs, yada yada yada. Uh, if everything is you know kind of working well, when you run less prepare.log, you know you'll see this big file that looks like so. It just kind of goes on and on and on uh, like this. Are, are people able to get this far? Uh, I, uh, my log it doesn't look right. Yeah. I'm getting yeah. a data zero must be supplied. I think I have to define data, 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 data Yeah, so you're, so you're going to have to give these uh, input. Oh, so this little funny marker is called a backtick. It lives on your keyboard on just left of your one. Oh, oh, I yeah, so it's not, a, it's not a single quote. It's a, I'm sorry, it's a backtick. What I'm saying is, so PWD is a command that gives the current working directory. If you put it in backticks, that says set this data dir equal to the output from this command. It's like a Unix trick, so that you know if you if you move into a different directory, this command would still work. Uh, if things get really confused, the easiest thing to do is just like basically start over, get out of the ASM directory, delete it, unpack the tarball again, you know, start over. It only takes five seconds to um, prepare the data if everything is working well. Okay. Are, are people getting, when they look at the prepare file, getting some head nods? Super. OK. So that was, that was kind of step one. If we do an ls in this directory, we'll see some basically some new files are created. So it'll be like frag reads, fast b. This is the Broad's like internal binary format for sequence data. Rather than these terrible fast q files, which have all these terrible pro properties, let's write it out in a standard format for, fast, for the Fragment libraries and for the jumping reads, there's other information in, the, in, in some of the other directories. Okay, so now that we've prepared the data, we can actually launch the assembler. That'll take like a couple minutes. So let's go ahead and launch it, and then I'll walk through the slides to explain like what's going on behind the scenes. So let me switch back to my notes slide so I can bring up the right thing. Again, I'm going to skip over um, some of the discussion. So I'm just going to copy this line here where it says run all pass LG. Pre equals data dir, all this stuff. I'm just going to copy all that. I'll paste it in here, and then I'll show you guys what's going on. Okay. So, on this slide, which is slide 29, the critical thing is this run all pass lg pre equals reference name data run threads all this. 
When you push enter, um, it should like, it looks like it's hung. In reality, it, that means it's actually running right now. It'll take, like, like I said, it'll take a couple minutes um, to actually run the assembler. Um, so don't panic if it looks like it's hung. It just means that it's working. If it comes back right away, you probably have a typo. I've, so hopefully you're, you're able to get stuff to run. Are people able to get to this point where it's just kind of hanging out? Core dumped? Yeah. That sounds like bad news. Uh, huh. Can I see your hands? Do you have any magnets in your fingers? Try again. Uh, yeah. It's kind of a mystery. There was, I don't know if it was, uh, for whatever reason, it wasn't. Uh, properly configured. What I suggest is cheat off your neighbor. We're, the the assembly part will uh, just take a couple minutes. Are, are there any other people able to get these get to this point where it's just kind of running? Is that a yes. Just kind of hanging out. Hanging out. It's good. So we got one. So it must have been a cosmic ray that crashed here. Crashed here. Sorry about that. Okay. So we're just gonna let this hang out again. For small stuff, minutes. For microbes, few hours. For human, few days. For big plant genomes, few weeks to few months of just hanging out. Um, for a zebrafish? Zebrafish. Oh, a few days. <laughs> a few days. <laughs> oh, you're in for misery. Ah, so it, along the way, so. Even though it's like I'm running one command, behind the scenes it's actually running like many, many different commands. It'll, it'll basically um, uh, build up progress along the way. So if it crashes, often you can just like restart it and it's not such a big deal. There are a couple steps where you know makes critical edits on the fly and then if it crashes then things go bad. But in general you can just rerun the command and it'll just pick up. Okay, so let's, let's uh, talk about What's going on? OK, so uh, I didn't invent this terminology. This is like, apparently, life at Broad is highly structured and regimented because they want the data to like live in this particular path where it's like there's a prefix, then there's a genome name, there's a data directory, then there's a run name. They want it to like be in this high, again, I'm mean like, you know, whatever. It's like this is how they've set it up at the Broad to run. So on the command that we just gave, um, normally, it wants like a separate uh, path, you know, to represent prefixes where all your assemblies live and the name of your genome and all this stuff. So we've we've subverted, if you will, the the Broad by just saying, yep, everything lives in this dot directory. Dot is a special Unix shortcut, meaning everything's in the current directory. So it's like behind the scenes, it's doing weird things like looking in the dot slash dot slash dot slash dot directory, which just means the current directory. So again. The uh, life of the broad must be highly uh, uh, structured because that's like built. In. It's like very fundamental to the algorithm. If you don't do that, it'll complain that you haven't set these important variables. Okay, so we just ran everything. Uh, we told it to just look for all the data in the current directory just to keep it convenient. Um, now, after you run, it's going to create a whole set of intermediate files, and then there's going to be a couple of really key files that has like the good stuff in it. So the, the main outputs that we're going to look at are going to be the contig FASTA file and then the assembly FASTA file. The assembly FASTA file has these scaffolds. So if we look in there, we're going to see regions where it's going to be like NNNNNNNNN. That's going to be where there's going to be those gaps. Whereas in the contig file, it's just going to be you know, sequenced along the way. So we're going to look for that in just a second, uh, be able to check out those files. The other thing that's going to be in there is um, it's going to have this so-called eFASTA, this enhanced FASTA format. And that's because the assembler knows about things like simple heterozygosity, simple regions of heterozygosity. So if you're assembling like the human genome, if you, looked, you know, if you looked at a strict interpretation of the assembly graph, it should break any time there's a heterozygous SNP. But we expect a heterozygous SNP like every 1,000 base pairs, so that would restrict your contigs to be like a 1,000 base pairs. So instead, what it's going to do it's basically, you know, in the, in the contig file, contig FASTA file, it's just going to basically plow through where those bubbles are from the heterozygous SNPs. 
But in this eFASTA file, it's going to say, oh, go 1,000 base pairs, and then you have a heterozygous A or G or whatever. And then another 1,000 base pairs, another heterozygous base. And then another 1,000 base pairs, another heterozygous base. The way this gets encoded is going to be through uh, these little braces. So as we look in the eFASTA file, it'll be like sequence, 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 brace, A, comma, C. This means a heterozygous SNP. And then base, 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 base. Um, this, is, this is a very cool idea to embed in your reference genome where this heterozygosity is. Very cool idea. In practice, it sucks because there's no programs that know what an eFASTA file is. So you're like, you want to align against it or blast it or mummer it. It'll crash because it'll be like, oh, here's a brace. I don't know what to do with that. So it's a very cool idea. A very active line of research right now is developing algorithms that actually know about uh, these so-called reference graphs where you can embed variants in there, but it's, uh, uh, I would say the tools are quite primitive today, but I do expect over time to see more and more of this. Question? Yeah, so mine's done running. Yep. And so. So is mine, by the way. Yep. All right, I was to yeah, so yeah, so if things are good, it'll hang for a while, and then, I don't know, three or four minutes later, you'll get back to your prompt. If you type ls, you'll see that it just created a bunch of new files. One of the key uh, things it'll create is a directory called default. That's where the assembly will live. And in, a, in, a, in like one minute, we're going to go look at that and go check out what, what's in present. So you get a FASTA file, like a regular FASTA file, you get this enhanced FASTA file. If you're, you know, if you're really interested in heterozygosity, you can try to use this eFASTA e format. Unfortunately, the tools just aren't there yet to make effective use of this. It'll be a lot more practical to look at the FASTA file, remap your reads, call SNPs in like the regular way, get a VCF file, unfortunately. It's, like, it's kind of ridiculous that we have to do that, but that's where we are. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's go look at our assemblies. Did, our, did the assembler complete for everybody? Getting some head nods? If you do ls, you see this default directory. Sorry, we got a cosmic rays that crashed. You know, one out of 25 of those crashed. So sorry about that. OK, so knock on wood, let's, let's cd into this default directory. If I just do ls, you'll notice that there's like gazillions of new files in this directory. In fact, let's see, there are 122 new files in this directory. And that's because, again, if, you know, I just showed that one snapshot where there's going to be many rounds of processing so, you know, correct errors and um, uh, build the unit pass and look, do many rounds of scaffold and all this stuff. So, you know, creates all these intermediate files. That can be a good thing for the reason that we just heard about. If, you know, the machine gets turned off, you can often restart it. It'll just remake the files that need to be made. So it's in a funny place, but in the, in the default directory, there's a subdirectory called assemblies, all capital letters. And then for whatever reason, I don't, know, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know why the bro did this. Even though it's called tests, this is where like your real assembly lives, is actually in this test directory. So if you kind of dig through the letters of the hierarchy, we'll finally get into the directory where the, where the good stuff lives. And in fact, if we just look at this, uh, you know, all, the final, all of the files that start final, we're going to see, aha, here's that final FASTA file. Here's that final um, uh, contigs file. There's also this eFASTA format, which is the, a graph. There's this new file format called FASTG, another graph format. Again, a beautiful idea. Just we're very limited in the tools that are available today. So let's look, go ahead and look at the um, contig file. So I'm just going to open this in, you know, in less. Just looks like you know regular DNA, nothing too exciting here. Now, does anyone have any ideas on how we could like I don't know count how many contigs are present here? Grep, grep, grep's your friend. So let's grep for the oh, extremely important. Whenever you're grepping, make sure it's in single quotes. You do not want to clobber your assembly. Uh, speaking from experience, so. Okay, so we, we have contig, you know, like good computer scientists, we're going to start counting at zero. Uh, contig zero, one, two, three. So we have four contigs that are present here. Um, let's do the same thing on the assembly file. Again, uh, tab is your friend. Ah, so we created one scaffold, um, four different contigs that were present there. 
Uh, there's a, s let's see, is this the right file? Uh, nope. Uh, where's the log file? So scaffold is the assembly of multiple contents. Yes, so actually that's a good idea. So let's look in this FASTA file. So final assembly.fasta. Again, it's just, you know, it's just nucleotides. I'm just hitting the space bar, just nucleotides. In, in the command less, you can search for things. So I'm going to hit the slash key and then capital N. Ah, so what it just, what it just took me to, some random position, here's like N, 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 N. Now this is a pretty small gap. So this means that there is just some you know, small region of the genome from the mate pairs. We have a really good idea of the size. It's not so big, but it kind of just couldn't figure out. For whatever reason, it couldn't figure out what the sequence there. So it's just going to write N, 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 N. Uh, we know that this scaffold has four different contigs in there, so there should be three blocks where it's just N, 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 N. We got lucky in that there's no, like, unlike the, the reference human genome, which I think the worst region is like several million Ns in a row, uh, here we just have a few regions that are all very short. So you can just um, confuse some of the mapping, but not too bad here. Question? Ah, yeah. Uh, it is totally a coincidence. So the, th the threads, so parts of all pass can take advantage of when your computer has multiple cores in it. So the threads are saying, go ahead and use you know, up to four different cores. But it's totally coincidental that we got four contigs as a result. Any other questions? OK, so uh, let's go ahead now. So now we have the contigs file. Uh, we have the scaffolds file. Let's go ahead and align our contigs uh, to the reference genome. So the command, so let's, let me bring up my notes so that I get exactly the uh, thing that we want here. Oh, you know what? I seeded it into a different directory. So we're going to do it this way. So I'm going to run this command called uh, nukemer, which should hopefully already be um, from the test directory. From the test directory, yep. We're going to run the command nukemer, which is the whole genome aligner that I presented earlier on. If I had another, I don't know, a few hours, I would talk about all the cool algorithms that go on inside of it, but we don't have the time for that. Um, so I'm going to give the, this command. It should just take like one second to run. So the, the critical command is here. So it's this funny word, nukemer, dash, dash, max match tilde slash asm slash ref.fa. This is the reference FASTA file for that funny microbe. And then I'm just giving it the path to the contigs file. I happen to be in the test directory, so I don't have to give a full path. It just knows to look in the current uh, directory. Unlike, say, BWA, where there's a separate step where you first index the genome and then align to it, in this nukemer package, mummer package, it does that kind of on the fly for you. So the first thing that it's going to do is look at the reference genome and build an index. It doesn't use a, a burroughs wheeler transform. It uses another uh, data structure called a suffix tree to do that super fast. Um, once it builds a suffix tree, it's going to look through the sequences to find uh, the matches very quickly. This is, this is a pretty small sequence. So it's 23,000 base pair um, uh, reference genome. Uh, so it takes like you know, just a fraction of a second to do the alignment. The main output file from this is going to be what's called a delta file. The, so, you know, it's not a huge file. It, a delta file is a text file, but it's written, it's, it's written in a funny code. It, the way that it is a text file, I can, you know, you can look at it, but you should basically never look at the delta file by hand because it's such a funny code. It's a... You should think of it as like, a, as like a database of alignments, kind of like a SAM file. You would never look at a SAM file by hand. It's like way too complicated. You're going to let other programs look at it. So the main program that we're going to use to look at this is going to be called Show Chords, which is going to scan through this uh, database and then give you kind of the meaningful alignments that are present there. So I just ran this command here, uh, Show Chords out.delta. And this is going to give me the coordinates of all the alignments that were, that were matched up there. This is very much like uh, you know, looking at um, you know, the, the results from a, I don't know, a BWA. It's sort of like a bed file, except that it's going to, what, the way to read this is, is 
uh, from this position to this position of the reference matches this position to this position of the query. So we have to have the coordinates from uh, both sequences. If you spend a lot of time at this, you can stare at it and make some sense of it. Or we can make one of those dot plots that will have a nice visualization. So let's go ahead and make a dot plot of what this looks like. So the way we're going to do that is using this command called mummerplot. If, um, if you allow it, you can create an interactive visualization. But what we're going to do is just create a PNG file that has, uh, yeah. We're just going to create a PNG file that has the, the dot plot uh, present. So if everything works well, we're going to get some like weird error messages. Don't worry about those. The critical thing is you're going to get this line here that says rendering plot at dot PNG. So in like one second, it made a dot plot that shows how our assembly compared to the reference genome. Now, unfortunately, it's a little bit tedious to, to look at a PNG, right? You have to copy it back to your laptop uh, and then open it. The trick that I'm going to do, I, th I think this is going to work. It worked the other day. Uh, the, we have like the worst possible permissions on the, oh, sorry. We have like the worst possible permissions on the instances right now. I think this is going to work. You're right. What is the IP? This is the IP. That is my IP. Uh, nope. I want my, here it is. That's my IP address. So we have like the worst possible uh, permission setup where if you just go to your IP address in the browser, it shows you your own home directory. This is a terrible thing to do, but it was very practical for teaching purposes. So I can just like in the browser now go into that directory. Please don't tell anyone that we let you do this. And then it'll bring up the PNG file. So it's the most boring dot plot you can possibly get. <laughs> so here's uh, on the x-axis is the reference genome. On the y-axis are the contigs we just put together. So if you kind of squint at this funny plot, here's contig 0. Uh, that, stand, that extends from here to here. Here's contig 1, here to here, 2, 3. So like, so most of these contigs like perfectly match the reference. That's why there's just this straight line. It's very boring. The only thing that's a little bit interesting, if you notice here, here's contig zero. Notice here there's these like funny dots. And what that is saying is that there is a structural variation here where the, where the uh, contig we just put together has a bit of sequence that is not present in the reference genome. If we had it set up a little bit better, we could zoom in on this. And what we had noticed is that if I kind of blow up just that segment, it'll align, and then it'll jump straight up, and then it'll keep aligning. So what, do we, what does that mean? Exactly, exactly. So the, it's going to jump straight up. If we could zoom, this is just a static plot, but if you zoomed in here, we'd be able to see it jump straight up, and that will correspond to, at this position in this contig, there's, a, there's a, a phantom insertion here. Any idea what that could be? <coughs> Our code. Very good, very good. Now, uh, okay, so let's, let's try to figure out what's going on here. So in the, let's, let's rerun that show chords command. So we know it's in contig zero. And indeed, when you look at the kind of, let me try to get this so it'll fit. It's, it's kind of gets confusing when it wraps. Okay. so. The first um, two lines both come from contig zero. So that's like the first half of the alignment and then the second half of the alignment. So notice contig uh, zero aligns from 1 to 26,755. And then something weird happens, right? The next alignment starts at 27,652. So from 26,755 to 27,652, it doesn't align in there. So that's like, that's the good stuff. We want to go in try to go figure out what's inside of there. Um, this could be like, I don't know, where, again, this is like, oh, this is where the tumor virus inserted itself into the genome. Let's go check out what that is. So the way that we're going to pull that sequence out is using SAM tools. Uh, SAM tools is a very um, flexible program. It has a lot of modes of operation, one of which is to pull out just arbitrary segments. You can ask for whatever you want. It's a two-step process. The first, uh, first step 
will be to uh, index the FASTA file. That just takes like a millisecond. So I'm just going to run samtools faidx uh, final.contigs.fasta. That'll create like a little auxiliary index file on the side that you can then use to look stuff up. And then this, I'm going to run it again, but this time I'm going to specify coordinates. So we know the alignment works really well up to 26,755. So we want to start at the next base, the 26,756. And then we're going to run it to uh, one base before this, 27,651. 27, uh, six, excuse me, 651. So if I push enter, it'll just show me, you know, DNA. Nothing too exciting there. It, nothing too exciting here except that this DNA doesn't occur in the reference. So, okay, the last step now is just to run it through our decoder. So we can just pipe that into our decoder. Uh, oops. Let me um, make this a little bigger so everybody can see what I'm going to do. Too big. So I'm just going to run it into DNA decode dash D. So we just took this. Uh, DNA sequence, ran it through the decoder. Aha! Congratulations to the Cold Spring Harbor event sequencing course. We'll have to keep searching for our stick base. Uh, yay. yay! Everybody get the secret message? Yes. So, you know, the decoding step obviously was, you know, is, is kind of just silly. Um, but everything else was like, you know, really solid genomics, right? We had data, we had reads. Uh, we assembled them, we aligned it, we made a dot plot, we used SAM tools to like pull out the interesting sequence. Here we ran it through the silly decoder. Probably what you would do is then take this sequence, like blast it, or uh, run it through database, you know, different databases, try to figure out what it was. So operationally, everything was real except for the last step where we ran it through the silly decoder. Oh, just to kind of convince yourself that um, it does something useful, let's just, you know, give it arbitrary different coordinates and then run it through the decoder, and you'll just get like random goobly gunk, right? You know, so it's like trying to decode it into a binary string, you get garbage. So if you, over almost all the genome, if you just run this decoder, you get nothing, if, except it's this special search sequence that is present there. Okay, so, so uh, are there any questions about what we did? So the, um, the slides with like, all the commands we ran are present, the installation instructions for all pass. Mummer is very easy to install, it's in SourceForge, takes three seconds to build it. But are there any sort of questions about, you know, the concepts about what we went over today? I'm really, you know, I'm really a concepts guy. So in a month, we'll remember Dickens, remember the three secret ingredients to a good assembler. You'll remember, oh, if we use short reads, we should use all pass. If we're using long reads, we should be using Solar assembler. In reality, what you remember is, oh, I think they have a PDF someplace. It has a bunch of notes on this. So that's... Knowing where the right answer is, is is really the most important thing to remember. Question? Why are some genomes so big? Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, well, we, can, we can talk a little philosophy. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there's, 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 there's this paradox that the size of the genome is not related to that question. Yeah, yeah. We talk about plants and stuff, and why, why are they you know, so, I mean, you know. Why are they so big? Why are they big? Why are they big? Uh, well, I can tell you what's known, right? So in like the Loblaw pine genome, huge genome, six times bigger than human, does not have a significantly larger number of uh, protein coding genes, nothing like that. What it has is a huge composition of transposable elements. So for, you know, from whatever the origins were, the mechanisms that were either trying to regulate transposable elements or perhaps allow for the creation of new sequences by allowing these things to jump around, uh, it just, there was this massive expansion. I mean, the thing they got to keep in mind is the genome is, again, is, this, is like this battlefield of where all these competing forces have been playing out over eons, just insanely uh, long time periods where our intuitions about how things should behave are totally suck, right? When you think about uh, evolution over a billion years, our intuitions just suck. So the explosion of transposable elements, is that ongoing in plants, or is that something that just basically happened in the kind of ancestor of all plants? 
it's, uh, it's, uh, it's worse than that. It's, uh, it continues on. So uh, there's something, uh, it, we've observed transposable elements active in human genomes. In fact, there's a, there's a strong indications that certain psychiatric disorders are caused, you know, kind of late onset uh, dementia type things are because transposable elements are active in neurons and are reinserting themselves. Uh, the good news is your germline is like, is like a fortress and the genome sets up all these pathways to like pr try to prevent transposons from jumping into your sex cells. Uh, but occasionally it happens and then they get propagated and then you know, the population dynamics plays out. But the genome is a, is a, is a battlefield where all these forces are competing. Uh, so, it's, so plants in particular are many species have undergone like whole genome duplications. There's this battlefield of transposable elements. You know, it's a, it's a tug of war between, you know, um, uh, you know, there's selective pressures basically trying to keep things cons constrained, but then, you know, there's warfare of all these foreign invaders trying to make it bigger. So if a lot of the variability is transposable elements, how much does the, the amount of coding sequence vary from, like, organisms of about the same order? I mean, you can very successfully align more or less, I don't know, maybe not every, but more or less every, more or less every genome, every gene in human to mouse, right? It's not the genes that are, that are evolving per se, it's the regulation, the regulatory elements that are mutating. So that's you know, many millions of years of evolution. You can pretty much find a one-to-one -one correspondence in mouse. If you look at other mammals, you can see it. Um, there are certain sets of genes that you can, you can trace back you know, in human, go to other mammals, go to other vertebrates, go to other plants, go to yeast, you, know, you, can, you can find um, our, we can find our ancestors in yeast quite readily, right? So there's, you know, the, you know, the tree of life is a, is a really useful um, way to think about this, where you can, you can absolutely uh, track these progressions. If you look, you know, as, if, as, you, as you look further and further back, the numbers get a lot smaller, whereas, you know, we share something like 25,000 genes in common with mice, we only share maybe a few hundred or a few thousand in common with lower yeast. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Other questions? Other questions? Okay, uh, that's all I had to to present today. If you you know in a if later on you ever have questions, check out the resources, um, the wiki, you know the web pages. Honestly, your best friend is Google, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff available on the web today. It wasn't that when I got started in genomics, that was not true at all. But now there are a lot of things. There's a lot of forums. There's a lot of blogs. There's a lot of papers. Google is your friend to find these resources on any of the topics that we're going to be talking about in the course. So, you know, that's your number one resource. If you're Googling and get stuck, the best thing to do is cheat off your neighbor. And by that, I mean, you know, go talk to other people at your institution, conferences, meetings. Um, if you, uh, 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 if you are highly motivated, you can try talking to like the developer of different tools. But the reality is, is we get bombarded with requests to help. I can't, I just can't possibly assemble everyone's genome on the planet as much as I would like to. Um, uh, so you can, you know, you can, if you, if, if things like the, you know, the, the program crashes, I'm very interested in that. So if, if it's one of my programs and it crashes and it can, crashes in a reproducible way, let me know, let the developers know. We're very interested in fixing bugs like that. But if you're like, I'm very stuck on this, please help me, well, you know, uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's asking a lot of somebody. You know, these are big projects often. You know, a very practical thing to do is form different collaborations. So like my lab has a lot of expertise in certain things, we suck at other things, but if we get the right team put together through collaborations, that's very practical to be able to move forward on this. But you have to acknowledge that, you know, there's a process to building collaborations. People want to work with their friends. So, a really useful thing to do is now you all have 20 odd new friends so you can all work together. Or you can meet and talk to people at conferences and if someone just presented on a cool idea, go talk to them. You know, people love to talk about the work, go talk to them, find out more about them and that can, you can build on that to have really productive collaborations. I can't tell you how many uh, millions of dollars have been launched out of the Cold Spring Harbor bar where it's like after a good talk, it's like, oh, that's really cool. Let's work together on this. Let's write a grant on this. Let's, you know, let's build on that. Um, it's, it's that, you know, that's a, I mean, it's 
crazy to think about, but the bar is like such an effective place to like uh, work on these things together. So I really, you know, uh, I really strongly encourage you to talk to each other. This is how the whole field uh, moves forward. Okay, so I, I thank you very much for your attention. I believe, are we just breaking for dinner now? Is there another talk? Let's, let's bring up the schedule before I say something that's, that's totally off. Let's check it out. Where's the uh, schedule? In the home? Okay. It's so, so well hidden, the very first thing. Today is the 18th. Today is the me. We have dinner. Ah, that's right. So we have a uh, uh, long break now until 6.30. Go have fun at dinner. Uh, tonight, Ken Dewar is going to be talking. He's going to be building on some of these things. So as I presented Illumina Assembly, he's going to go in great depth on Pack Bio Assembly. Thank you all very much, and good luck.